Please be seated. I hope you see how that hymn ties in with what we spoke about this morning, doing all for the glory of God, living for Jesus a life that's true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace, such love constrains me to answer his call, follow his leading, and give him my all. Living for Jesus wherever I am, doing each duty in his holy name, willing to suffer affliction and loss, deeming each trial a part of my cross. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of his smile, seeking the lost ones he died to redeem bringing the weary to find rest in him. And then the commitment, O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, holding nothing back. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. He's the Lord of your life. My life I give, henceforth to live. That's everything. O oh, Christ, for thee alone. Do all to the glory of God do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, tonight to our passage over in Acts chapter 28. We're looking at miracles and money, part two. We're in Acts chapter 28, verses six and following. Last week, of course, was Reverend Coleman while I was in Mexico for the ICC Aladic meetings. Last time in Acts was back in February 5th where we had part one of Miracles and Money, and tonight it's part two. And as an introduction to that entire study, we have at least one more week to go on it, part three. But as an introduction, on January 29th, we had a fifth Sunday special DVD exposing the signs and wonders movement and saw the demonic nature of the so-called charismatic faith healers. So I hope you're picking up some things from this. There's a lot of deception that's out there, and there is a specific reason for it, and we're going to study that, the Lord willing, Tonight, we're in Acts chapter 28, I'll begin reading in verse 6. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed they laded us with such things as were necessary. The faith healers look at this and they say, wow, look at that. When Paul did these miracles, people gave him stuff. I think I want to get into this. And so we have all the charlatans that we have studied and especially as we saw actual and and sometimes the way that they're doing this kind of stuff is sort of nonchalant and like couldn't really care like I remember that one picture of the guy standing there and the faith healer Benny Hinn walks up to him and smacks him on the forehead and he falls over and Benny Hinn just walks around and smacks people on the forehead I mean people you don't see the apostle Paul doing that kind of stuff but before we look at it let's pray our gracious heavenly father how we thank you once again for your word and for its power and how we thank you that it is very clear and distinct to the apostolic powers and how they use them for the glory of Christ and not for their own wealth, not for their own prestige, not so that Paul could get away from the Romans or some other thing like that. They use them for the glory of God. Father, help us with whatever gifts you've given us, even if we think it's a small gift, to use it for the glory of God and use it fully because it's from you and not the fake stuff that's going around today. We pray, Father, for your blessings on this time together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, tonight we're talking about Miracles and Money Part 2, which ties in well with what I told you the last time we were in Acts, and what, as I said, is becoming clearer and clearer to me the longer that I live. The things of earth slow you down, and yet the faith healers, so-called, that's all they're focused on, the things of earth. Put bluntly, things of earth may be the very reason you die, and for some people, the reason that they will end up going to hell, which I think most of those guys are. I don't think they're real believers. 
So you want to collect things of Earth. A lot of people want to collect things of Earth. Sometimes the collecting process just creeps up on you, especially if you have a family. <laughs> I saw that when I began to move up here uh, from Alabama. I didn't move my stuff. Man, am I glad I don't have all my stuff. <laughs> I got a house full of stuff down in Wilsonville. It's been broken into five or six or seven, maybe ten times. I don't know how many times. It doesn't really matter. Nothing much there to steal. It's things of earth. You know, people break in. They look around. Kids have actually left graffiti inside. And uh, I had written out a piece of paper for uh, my kids when they came to visit the house just to say that they checked up on it. So they sign their names and they write the date that they've come in. And some little hoodlum, <laughs> probably a 12 to 15 year old kid, uh, actually saw the paper and uh, he didn't write his name, but he wrote down, I was here on such and such a day. <laughs> Things of earth, they tie you down, especially if you have 13 kids. And that stuff just begins to pile up on you over the years. Don't have time to fiddle with it. Just stick it in a box, shove it over in the corner. If you've got a big enough house, you just keep sticking it in boxes, shoving it over in the corner and stuff like that. And after a while, you open the boxes and I've done this and I found that there's mildewed clothing inside and we throw it away. You know, giving lots of stuff away to the Goodwill and uh, actually Christian Service Mission. We don't give it to the Goodwill. We give it to a Christian organization that provides uh, food and clothing for uh, people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through over a hundred missions in the Birmingham area. But it gives you the idea of the things of earth tie you down. In fact, yesterday I spoke with my son Philemon as he was driving to bring my books to my house up in Wilsonville. He's been storing my library in his barn for years because when I came here, as you know, the church gave me an office that was 96 square feet and there was no way to stick books in there. And I actually filled up another whole room that size, 100 square feet, with books all the way to the ceiling, all the way to the door. And I just didn't have any room for the rest of them. They're down there in Philemon's barn because, yeah, that's my besetting sin. I've collected books over the years. Theology books, mind you. Books that I hope to use in ministry. But God in his wisdom put me in a situation here where I had no space to put out my library and so everything I have to do and prepare in my messages doesn't come from books except for one. The Bible. The Word of God. So I'm not quoting other people in my sermons. It's things that God has put into his word which is infinite in its scope. But it's the books he was holding for me. But now he sold his giant property, 40 acres and a huge house, trying to downsize, trying to move closer to his work in the city where his wife is finishing up her degree as a certified nurse practitioner. He suddenly began to realize how much stuff he had accumulated as their five children have grown, even with five. He'd already filled four storage lockers with their belongings. He'd already given away trailer loads, literally trailer loads, to the thrift store trying to move one of his beautiful large storage buildings that he personally built, the huge truck that he rented that drives uh, buildings down the road. He'd rented a company or hired a company to do this for him. Had gotten stuck in the mud on his property. He had to use a 10-foot tall John Deere tractor to pull the truck out. So you know what? He just decided to abandon the building. He said, you know, things of earth. It's tying me down. Why should I sweat this thing? The things of earth tie you down. And even though that building was valuable, it wasn't worth the agony of trying to save it. When he put his house on the market, he thought the house wouldn't sell right away because it's such a, a unique piece of property, huge piece of property, but they got a buyer after only eight days on the market. Suddenly, things of earth began to increase the stress, intense stress. And especially because they're about to go on an incredible ministry. Things of earth tie you down from doing ministry. What is that ministry? All of that was topped off by the fact that in just a few days, he and his wife are about to leave for an extended medical mission trip to Ecuador with a group of other Christian medical personnel. And he told me a fantastic story. I'll share it with you on Wednesday evening uh, so that you can pray for them as they go down there. But how God put this team of uh, Bible-believing Christians together, some from his own church that he didn't even know had signed up for that team. Another doctor, another, the doctor has a daughter who's a, a nurse, and, and they'd sign up for the team. And Philemon and Robin didn't even know that they were going to be going on this medical mission trip, how God put that team together. How Robin, who is working on her certified nurse practitioner degree, is actually going to get academic credit for going on this medical mission team. How God put that together. You stop and think about that. There's a sovereign God who wants us to do his will. So he thought that it was such a unique piece of property it would take months to sell, but suddenly God in his grace sent an immediate buyer. 
When God wants to move it quickly, nothing is difficult for him. He can move with lightning speed. The issue is walking by faith and being in the exact center of his will. So please pray for Philemon and Robin as they seek to serve the Lord in the middle of all that pressure. And it will be a real mission trip, not merely doing good stuff, but sharing the gospel of Christ. So remember, it's not what you own. It's a matter of how you view what you own. You'll see how this undergirds the difference between biblical wealth that God provides for specific purposes and the wealth that the apostates get through their phony miracles. It's not a matter of what you own, but it's a matter of how you view what you own. You know, a rich man can be perfectly content and not at all covetousness or covetous. But a poor man who has nothing at all can be deadly covetous. You know, Job was rich. God did not condemn Job for being rich because Job had what God had given to him. The key was this. Job viewed himself as a steward who had to give an account for all that he had, and Job was willing to let it go when God took it. Did you pick that up in Job chapter 1? I know I, I talked about Job a little bit and his sufferings and how God uses sufferings to conform us to the image of Christ, but stop and think about Job's wealth. It says he was the richest man in the East. The richest man. That's like being a Bill Gates or somebody like that, or a George Soros, uh, who owns the big Greek shipping lines, or some of these other guys, I don't know all the names of them, but there are a lot of guys who have a lot of money. Job was one of those guys. And you know, he was willing to let it go when God took it. Regardless of the instrument that God used, he was willing to let it go when God took it. Let me read you just three verses. Then Job arose, after all this horrible stuff has happened, his kids have all been killed, and, you know, he's lost everything that he had. It says, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. He didn't scream and yell and run around like a chicken with his head cut off and say, oh, what happened to me? Oh, what happened to me? Oh, what happened to me? I want my money back. I want my money. Go get the Sabaeans. They got my camels. He didn't do that. It says he worshipped, and he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. It's not what you own or what you don't own. It's how you view what you own or don't own. Stop and think about this for a moment. Judas always had his needs met when he was with Jesus, yes? If you think that Judas had his needs met, please raise your hand. I want to make sure everybody's awake. Okay, all right. It sort of ripple to the back, but that's okay. Uh, Judas had his needs met, didn't he? Ever think Judas went hungry? I don't think so. But you know, that meant, when you look at what happened to Judas, that meant that Judas thought of himself as poor, and Judas didn't like that. He figured that if he was in the inner circle, he ought to have power and money at the least. So he decided to become the most trusted disciple so that he could control the money. He got himself appointed treasurer. The scriptures tell us specifically, though, that he was a thief. Judas is an excellent example of the apostates and these money-grubbing charismatics. Judas is an apostate. The word apostasy means one who falls away. Listen to John chapter 12, verses 1 and following. This is right before the death of Christ that this event occurs. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, uh, was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. 
There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, <coughs> very costly, very costly. This was a big, what you might call, in-kind donation if you were reporting it to the IRS. And anointed the feet of Jesus. The feet! With the most expensive spice you can get. And wiped his feet with her hair. A woman's hair is her glory, according to the Apostle Paul. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. How would you like to have been Simon and had a son like Judas? And his name is recorded with his son's name. Does it give us shudders who are parents? It should. Simon's son, which should betray him. Here's what Judas said. Quite pious and seemingly much for the benefit of others. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? Keep that number in mind, 300. And given to the poor. Doesn't that sound good? I mean, that's really, really, really pious. I mean, we've got everything we need. Let's, let's give all this money to the poor. Verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. And his hand went into it as well apparently quite frequently. 300 pence and given to the poor. I hope you pick up in that story there that the incident made Judas mad. He wanted the money from selling the expensive spike nerd. He was determined to get that money one way or the other, so he did. He sold Jesus since he couldn't sell the spike nerd. In his heart he was greeting and willing to sell God the Son for 30 pieces of silver. That, folks, is 10%. That was the cut that Judas would have taken. The charismatic so-called faith healers with their signs and wonders are like Judas. They sell the Son of God put money into their own pockets. They pretend to be God's messengers and one of God's disciples, but they are just like Judas. Do you get mad when you don't get your own way? Judas did. Do you get mad when you don't get your own way? What are you willing to do to get what your carnality wants? Be careful, you may be a Judas. We don't know what his scam was. Maybe Judas had a scam where he took donated goods and got a kickback when he sold them. Maybe he took donated goods and then pretended to sell them for one price, but since he got cash, he put the excess in his pocket. Ananias and Sapphira were like that. Maybe Judas had a phony buyer who purchased the items and then later sold them and gave a portion back to Judas. We're not told. But whatever the scam was, the scripture tells us Judas was a thief. And amazingly, the disciples trusted him. Maybe he had his MBA, but it's obvious that he cooked the book, so they never guessed. You know, Proverbs gives us the correct attitude toward the things of earth and towards money. Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 7. It says, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. So here's a prayer that Solomon 
prayed even though God gave him incredible riches. Solomon, just like Job, wealthiest man on the face of the earth. But God took it away from Job and God didn't take it away from Solomon. Interesting. Even though Solomon had some very, very horrible weaknesses in other areas and sin, Money was something that God could trust to Solomon. But I think it was because of what Solomon indicates in his attitude and in his prayer in Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove from me, far from me, vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. That's the second part of his prayer. Feed me with food convenient for me. So the first part of his prayer was don't keep vanity and lies. I don't want to get proud and I don't want to be surrounded by liars. Second part of his prayer was give me neither poverty nor riches. Now he had riches, but that wasn't the focus of his life. Feed me with food convenient for me. And here's the reason lest I be full if I got so much it'll cause me to deny you and say who is the Lord or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain have you ever prayed a prayer like that God don't give me too much money <laughs> have any of you ever prayed oh God I've got too much money <laughs> please don't give me so much money have you ever prayed that that shows a heart attitude here feed me with food convenient for me give me what is necessary. My God shall provide all your needs, not all your greeds, but all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God gives some people lots of money and they are held accountable for the way in which they use the money. Don't be jealous or envious of them because they're going to have to give an account for every penny that ever crossed their palm. But so will you, regardless of how little you got, and then spent it in a stupid way, and then came up to the end of the month and wondered what you're going to do next. The point of those verses is contentment. I'm going to give you a couple of passages here, and I, I want you to look at the context of each passage, and verses that we love to pull out of the context, but ignore the entire context. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. So in other words, follow my example, says the Apostle Paul. He's going to be talking about money here in just a second. And he's saying, follow my example. And the God of peace shall be with you. Paul set the example of sacrifice. We've been studying that all the way through the book of Acts. Paul set the example of sacrifice. Paul was a gifted man. The Apostle Paul, if he had decided to go along with the crowd, could have been on the, uh, you know, the inner circle of the Sanhedrin, whereby he was getting all the money that was raked in in the temple offerings if he would have just kept his mouth shut. Verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. And he's going to talk about how the Philippians gave to support his ministry. At times, Paul worked to support his ministry. I've done that too. Uh, I've worked in all kinds of weird jobs when churches couldn't pay me. But Paul said, hey, it was a good thing that the Philippians actually supported his ministry. Your care of me hath flourished again. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Remember the point of that Proverbs passage is contentment. Paul had learned how to be content. You say, well, yeah, but he always had plenty, right? No. Paul says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now we all know verse 13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you know it's in the context of Paul talking about sometimes 
he was suffering because the churches didn't support him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the context of that. There's another great verse down here along that same line. Uh, verse 14, notwithstanding, you've done well that you did communicate. And that word communicate is the word share. Means to share, not you talked about my afflictions. You communicated with my afflictions. Oh, he said, oh, isn't it neat how Paul suffers all the time? Wow, he's really cool. He, he suffers and suffers and suffers. Wow, that's great. Glad he can do it. I sure wouldn't want to do that. That's not what that's talking about. The word communicate is the word share with my affliction. Now, he didn't say you threw in money because I promised you that if you, you sent me back a prayer cloth, I would pray over it and you'd get rich. We never see anything like that, the Apostle Paul doing. Verse 15. Now, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated, that's the word for sharing, with me as concerning giving and receiving. They didn't just write to him and say, yeah, it's a neat idea about giving and receiving. We're sure glad that you talked to about that, and we'd like to talk about that more. No, that's not what he's saying here. No church shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. We've been going through the book of Acts. How many churches did the apostle Paul preach in and start dozens of them there was one church who picked up on this they'll give an account but ye only for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity not because I desire a gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account you know isn't that an interesting attitude Paul says you know I had some needs but that's what I was, wasn't what I worried about. I thought, you know, these Christians who are not giving and not supporting the work of the ministry, even though they're my spiritual children, wow, they're going to lose heavenly rewards. They're not going to have anything that abounds to their account. They're not going to get anything when they get to heaven. I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul says, you know, it's okay. You don't need to send more. I have all and abound just like that prayer we saw back in Proverbs chapter 30 verses 8 and 9 having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you an odor of a sweet smell a sacrifice acceptable well pleasing to God we spent a lot of time on that the odor of the sweet smell because you know it was a sweet fragrance that filled the room when Mary poured the ointment on Jesus' feet, it produced two different kinds of responses. It produced the commendation of Jesus for Mary and the promise that that would never be forgotten. And it produced the response of Judas, who decided, I'm going to get my cut anyway, I'll sell Jesus and let him get out of the the situation I mean I know he can get out of the situation I've seen him do it before I'll make myself my 10% and Je let Jesus worry about getting away didn't realize that God had foreordained this in the book of Jeremiah about the 30 pieces of silver that would end up buying the potter's field where Judas would get buried after hanging himself There's a lot in there, but we don't have time for that tonight. You know, that's the context for verse 19. We all know that wonderful verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Don't forget the context. Look at verse 19, the very next verse. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise to the people who have given to support Paul. They did what pleases God. That's why God will meet all their needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Quite different story than you hear when you listen to the faith healers, the signs and wonders movement people. Look at another passage where Paul talks about money and apostates. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 5 if you're taking notes. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He's talking about the apostates and he says, They are perver the perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that, <clears throat> now here it is, 
supposing that here's their basic premise here's what makes them tick here's what they preach in their prosperity gospel supposing that gain is godliness well it must be from god and certainly this movement must be from god because look at the way the money pours in that proves i'm godly god is blessing this ministry smack him on the forehead knock him over god is blessing this ministry babble in tongues that's their basic premise is that a true premise that gain is godliness is that the truth no he says that's what these men of corrupt minds who are destitute of the truth is and he gives a command concerning those kinds of people from such withdraw thyself you don't have to sit and argue with them you don't have to sit there and say well you know what the bible says but they'll say but i had an experience i had a faith healer miraculously heal me of warts on the bottom of my heel okay so what does that prove nothing may prove that the faith healer was in contact with demons who'd caused the warts in the first place from such it says withdraw thyself have nothing to do with them now here we back to that principle of contentment listen to it godliness with contentment is great gain it's not gain is godliness godliness with contentment is gain because it's looking into the future into eternity not looking into time and what am i going to get out of this kind of stuff godliness with contentment are you content are you content if nothing else ever changed in your life would you be content with what you have right now that's a question you ought to ask yourself every morning when you get up you know um, modern advertising is based on the apostate theory that you need something more it's designed to make you discontent modern advertising is designed to undermine the christian mind man look at that dress in the window whoa whoa look at that man it's a watch it's a rolex watch and it's on for half price only thirty-two thousand dollars at half price for that thing i can wear on my wrist sort of like the story about the lawyer and people joke about lawyers being covetous and getting money whatever way they can sort of like apostates the lawyer is just driven up in his ferrari and uh he opens the door to get out and a truck goes by and slams in and knocks the door completely off slides it down the street and the lawyer jumps out of the car and he says my ferrari my ferrari and a passer buyer says you lawyers are all the same you, you only care about material things and you didn't even notice that your your arm was ripped off in the process and he looks down and he says my rolex my rolex Folks, are you content? Let that question sink in. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And here we have a reflection of the book of Job in verse 7. I just read you those verses. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out job says naked he came into the world and naked he'll go out 
You come in with nothing, you go out with nothing. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. That's the Christian perspective of how to use the resources that God has given you. That is not the perspective of the apostates who think that godliness is gain. There's your test. Notice what he says to be content with, verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Has God given all of us in this room more than food and raiment? Food and clothing? Has God given us more than that? Yes. You're a steward of it, you know. Your necessities are food and clothing. Many believers throughout the, the centuries, throughout the millennia, have had nothing more than food and clothing. And they've hidden out in caves. They didn't have cars. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have cell phones. We gripe when our cell phone gets a little bit old and we want the newest version which can download a whole more, lot more stuff and do a lot more things. It doesn't say with food and raiment and a house or food and raiment that's really, really nice raiment or really, really excellent food. It says food and raiment. Could you be content if right now you had nothing except food and clothing? That's the state to which we must strive to reach it if we're going to have God's perspective on material things because everything in this world everything is going to burn up don't let it hold your heartstrings too tight it's all going to burn up look at verse 9 I'm giving you these passages because this gives you the opposite viewpoint of what the apostates are like, the money magic people. But they that will be rich, that's their goal, that's their focus, that's their desire. They that will be rich. Have you ever dreamed, and I suppose those of you who have computers see these things that used to be that only came through the mail, but now they've got them on computers. Every now and then this thing pops up from the um, Publishers Clearing House, where you know they're going to give you five thousand dollars a week, and I've seen some of them that start off with give you three million dollars. I mean, they have different competitions or contests, I guess these are, over the years where it's just a lottery kind of a thing. You just enter your name, and some of them have said you're going to get this big, huge house here, and some of them say seven thousand dollars a week. I think the one that's coming up right now is a five thousand dollar week, and I keep clicking them and, and throwing them in the trash on my on the computer. Throw it in the trash, 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 throw it in the trash. Because what's it doing? It's appealing to greed. That kind of thing can eat your guts out. They that will be rich, it says, fall into temptation and a snare. It's like opening the door to temptation. Let me ask you a question. Suppose you got $5,000 a week. What would you do with it? Without working at all. You just, every week a check shows up. I suppose that's how they do it. Or maybe they direct deposit. I don't know. But suppose you got a check in the mail every week for $5,000. Do you feel yourself getting excited inside as you think about that? Sort of a smile inside your heart? Man. And now you're thinking about it and thinking, what was the first thing that came to your mind when you thought I'd get $5,000 a week? <laughs> Taxes, Missouri, Alabama. <laughs> Tithe? How about more than a tithe? If you're living on, say, $1,000 a week right now, um, would you give 80%? There was a guy by the name of R.G. Letourneau. He uh, is the one who started Caterpillar Industries. And he decided when he began his business, and you know Caterpillar is the one that makes those gigantic big earth-moving machines. He decided when he started his business that um, 
he would work on the 10%, 90% principle, but that he would keep only 10% and give 90% to God. Look where the business has gone. Incredible. Resources. They're not yours. They're not mine. 100% belongs to God. We are only stewards of the resources that God has put in our hands. And we must give an account to the owner as to how we used his resources. People, that's the difference between those who preach the gospel as Paul did and those who are the faith healer charismatic charlatans. Let's go back to the text. 1 Timothy. They that will be rich, that's their desire, that's their goal fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. It's not just a snare. The word snare, pagis there, uh, is, is also used of the snare of the devil when the devil catches you. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts. It's going to damage you and make you look stupid. Look at the last phrase. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Interesting that he uses that particular analogy because we've just looked at a shipwreck where everybody left everything behind so they wouldn't drown. I just made six airplane flights going down to Mexico, three down to get down there, three to come back. Coming back, everything was late and I was running, literally running. Praise God, thank you for praying for my knee because there is no way I could have made those planes coming back. I was getting there at the one between Mexico City and Atlanta as they were moving the people in and getting ready to close the door. Incredible. Drowning. If they waited behind to save some of their stuff, they would have drowned. On the airplanes, they keep telling you, now, you know, here's what will happen if you have, if we down in the water, you've got a life vest under your seat. I've never seen one of those life vests except around the neck of the stewardess up at the front of the plane. I wonder to myself often, is it really under there? You know, I've never tried to pull one out because then I get in trouble. I know that because we're not down in the water. But, uh, and you're supposed to take off your shoes before you jump on the rubber uh, slide that goes down to the life raft, which will be waiting at the bottom. You know. Oh, brother. But you know, if everybody tried to take off their suitcases, nobody would get off. They tell you, look for the closest exit. It may be behind you. And then I look at how long it takes people to get off the plane when it's parked at the gate. And I think this plane would be in 5,000 feet of water before anybody got out. <laughs> I got off the subject. Drown men in destruction and perdition. It not only destroys them here, it sends them to hell. Look at verse 10. Do you think Paul is giving a warning here? For the love of money, not money, the love of money, that's greed, that's covetousness. The love of money is the root of all evil. You know, want to know what the bottom line sin is that sprouts out at all these other different things? It's the love of money. That's a root but it produces a lot of branches and a lot of different fruit in a lot of different areas. People, that's what marks apostasy. Don't let the world tempt you into covetousness by the horrific advertisements that they give where they show you this beautiful car and a, a slutty looking woman leaning up against the car and batting her eyes at you like this. Or the proud thing where there's this tough-looking dude and he's wearing this kind of a suit and he's got on such and such a tie and such and such a watch and look at those shoes. Run from it. Run from it. 
The love of money is the root of all evil. Now listen to this. Which, while some coveted after, issue is covetousness, issue is greed, they have, whoa, they have erred from the faith. You understand that Satan uses greed and covetousness to pull you away from the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. That's what's happening in this miracles and money movement. The signs and wonders. They err from the faith. But look what it says in the last phrase. Why don't you want to get into it? Because you'll pierce yourself through with many sorrows. Oh, people. God has warned you. God has warned me. That's a constant temptation while we're here on earth. To run after the almighty buck, the greenback. What are we supposed to do? It tells you in verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. But don't just run away. You're supposed to run towards something. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And recognize that you're in a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Okay, there's a context. Context of apostasy. Look at another context. Let me give you one more passage. I can't believe our time is up already. Look over at Hebrews chapter 13. And look at the verses that surround the verse that I want to point out to you tonight. Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now look what he follows that with immediately. Let your conversation, that's the word for manner of life, be without covetousness. What are people desiring that's wrong in the passage? Fornication and adultery, sex, outside of marriage. Be content with such things as ye have. Remember, we were talking about contentment a moment ago. Are you content? Or have you been pulled in, sucked in to that horrible vacuum where no matter how much you get, it's never enough. Be content with such things as ye have. Until you can get to that point, don't expect more. For he hath said, this is God's promise to you, Jesus promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Did Judas have enough when he was with Jesus? Did he? Mm -hmm. But he allowed covetousness to get to him, and he sold God the Son for his cut, 30 pieces of silver. Be careful that you don't do that as you drag your eyeballs from one issue to another, things that you really, 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 really want. And then verse 7, or 6, excuse me, missed that, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Have you gotten to the point where you say it really doesn't matter? I have to say that many times during the day. I'll start to get frustrated about something and I say, I laugh to myself and I say, here I go again. You know, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they said. doesn't matter what he did. doesn't matter what uh, she was scheming to plot for. It doesn't matter. What matters is what does Jesus think about it? 
Focus on doing all to the glory of God. That brings us back to the message this morning. And then remember them which have the rule over you. That's the context of those who are in authority in the church, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Just like Paul said, consider me, my example. That's what he just said a moment ago when we were looking at the parallel passages. You know, the apostates are like Judas. They're like Ananias and Sapphira. They're like Elymas the sorcerer and others. They'll do whatever is necessary, including lying and stealing from the church and faking their donations to the church like Ananias and Sapphira did. And both charlatan miracles like sleight of hand magicians and demonically empowered miracles to get money and sex and power and other personal carnal benefits. God has given us two full chapters. We didn't even have time to get to them tonight. He's given us two full chapters in the New Testament and many other illustrations such as the seven sons of Sceva who practiced exorcism for money and Simon the sorcerer who wanted to buy power to give the Holy Spirit by laying on hands to warn us about those kinds of people. Both Peter and Jude write entire chapters against the money and miracle charlatans. Peter makes it clear that their first motive for preaching heresy is covetousness. And that's where we'll have to start next week with 2 Peter. Because he very clearly outlines for us what these guys are like, and it's what you see in the charismatic movement today. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly